it, it shouldn't be left voodoo economics. It just sh should be mainstream, left and right, voodoo economics. And it really is voodoo economics. I mean, voodoo economics is a term, I think, that George Bush Senior. Remember George Bush Senior? Junior's dad, who was president for four years, one-term president, after Ronald Reagan. I think he called Ronald Reagan's economics voodoo economics in the 1980s when he was running against him um, in uh, 1980 for the presidency. I think that's where the term comes from. So, the, no, Michael says, uh, uh, he says hello. I thought he said no. So, I, I mean, the voodoo economics was a uh, leftist, kind of left uh, Republican accusing the last semi-free market Republican of being voodoo. So the real voodoos, of course, Bush and the Democrats and Romney and almost all Republicans today and Trump, and it's, it's, it's truly voodoo because voodoo is mystical. Voodoo is primacy of consciousness. Voodoo is a prayer and a whim. And that's exactly what this economic theory is. So let's, let's start with the child credit. So the idea is this. The idea that poverty is, is high today in the United States, primarily because of COVID. And uh, of course, poverty has been um, mostly flat in the United States since the late 1960s. It was declining fast into the late 1960s and flattened out sometime in the late 1960s. And it's been coming up and down since then. And um, it's fascinating to me that if you were from another planet, didn't have the context and didn't have the embedded altruism that so many people have today, if you just showed up on planet Earth and you look at the graph of poverty and you, and you say, just, and this is poverty the way the government measures it. I'm not even, don't want to even all get into the whole statistical debate about what it means and uh, the fact that a lot of young people are, are poor and therefore they're calculating the poverty rate even though they all get out of poverty once they get their jobs or once they get out of college or everything. So the whole measure is bogus. But there are really poor people. There are people who truly struggle and the people that have a really, really hard time to be able to afford some of the basics uh, that they need in order to live. But I don't know that the poverty rate is actually capturing that. I'm not sure what the poverty rate actually captures and whether it's objective. But let's assume it was real. Let's assume it was real. And, and you came from another planet and you saw a graph that showed steady decline in the rates of poverty as measured by the government, and then it flattens out, and then it stays flat pretty much forever. It bounces around a little bit, recessions, economic growth, and so on. Wouldn't you ask the question, what happened in the late 1960s that caused the graph to flatten out? It was heading in a nice direction. Poverty was declining systematically. It was really going down and was, you know, it was heading towards zero. And suddenly it, it stops and it flattens out. What happened in the late 1960s to cause poverty not to go down anymore? And that would be the mystery. And anybody knows what happened in the late 1960s to cause the rate of poverty to, well, we don't know about cause, but you would want to know so that you could get a sense of cause and effect, right? You would want to know what coincided with it so that you could try to figure out causality. So what happened in the 1960s that is related to poverty? Well, we launched a war on poverty. We launched a war on poverty. And we established what the um, Johnson administration termed the Great Society. And we embraced not only Medicare and Medicaid, but then a whole array of poverty-killing, poverty-blasting into outer space welfare programs, which were, we were told, we were told, were guaranteed to eliminate poverty in America. And all of this came about during the Johnson administration, uh, so, so what would that be, 63 to 68? N never eliminated, never reduced, never really challenged until, to some extent, Bill Clinton's um, uh, uh, welfare reform. In, uh, in 1990, was it 97 or 98, I think? 
But really, the programs, the extent of them, certainly Medicare, Medicaid, but, but, but all the, the entire welfare infrastructure and the entire welfare uh, industrial complex, that's a new term we should, we should embrace. The welfare industrial complex or the welfare monetary complex or the welfare, I don't know, parasitical complex, whatever you want to call it. And I'm not talking about the people who receive welfare. I, I view them more as victims than anything else. I'm talking about the people who administer the welfare programs. We're talking about thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats and government officials and government programs at the state level that get money from the federal government and the federal government that has all these branches. And, and it's welfare in the United States is not one simple program where people get a check. It's a million different little programs where people get pieces of stuff. And you need a PhD in welfare sciences just to understand and figure out what you are owed. So one of the characteristics of American welfare is that people don't use it anywhere near as much as, for example, they use it in places like Europe. Not because they don't want to use it, but because it's so complicated, nobody knows how to use it. So, for example, a lot of the child credit and a lot of the like, negative income tax that we have, the earned income tax credit, all of those things, 22% of people who are eligible to use it and who actually file don't use it. Don't get it. Don't apply for it. Because it's so complicated. And, and one of the differences between the United States and Europe is Europe is much more efficient, less bureaucratic, less dribble and drabble in a million different programs with their welfare, right? Put aside the whole morality of welfare. But. So anyway, it's curious, isn't it? That about the same time as all these welfare programs, as a war on poverty was launched, poverty rates flattened out. Poverty rates flattened out. Right. Gene says, I can't find a poverty rate graph that doesn't start in 1959. Probably not measured before that. You can probably find it in people, in some studies where people uh, try to estimate what it was in the past. But you see, one of the great evils of government, this might be controversial what I say, one of the great evils of government in the last 40, 50 years is that they started measuring stuff. Because the more they measure, the more they think they can control, the more they want to intervene, the more they want to tinker, the more they want to influence. When it's not measured, they don't know, so they leave it alone. So government statistics are not a good thing. Not a good thing. Because the more they can, now today they know everything. They have statistics on everything. They've got a Federal Reserve. They, you know, Federal Reserve employees is the largest employer of economists in the world is the Federal Reserve. Maybe not in the world, because I don't know, maybe Chinese government employs more, but certainly in the Western world, the largest employer of economists is the Federal Reserve. I mean, that's all they do. They put together statistics. And the more statistics, the more central planning, the more they think they know, and the more we're just an average. We talked about this yesterday with the minimum wage and productivity and different, different ways of measuring income. You become just a statistics, it's just an average, and, then, and, and they just dabble in statistics, and then they want to manipulate the statistics. They don't want to enhance your life as an individual. They just want to manipulate the stat. Right. Anyway, all this is to say, all this is to say that poverty, as measured by the government, has been flat since we declared a war on poverty. Now, this is consistent with the fact that America, for a variety of different reasons, has not won a war since World War II. I mean, I don't count Grenada as a war, right? Or, or even the first Gulf War. How to, how to really define that as a victory. But given that you had to have a second Gulf War, um, didn't have to have, but had one. America has not won a war since World War II. It hasn't won a war, didn't win the war in Vietnam, didn't really win the war in Korea. It hasn't won the wars in the Middle East. 
Um, didn't win, hasn't won the war in Afghanistan. But hasn't won a war on drugs. You can't win a war on drugs, I would argue. And hasn't won a war on poverty. And again, you can't win a war on poverty. I mean, there's a simple principle there. You cannot have a war on an inanimate object. On some, you know, what does a war on poverty mean? It means nothing. You can't have a war on a condition. And a war is about blowing stuff up. A war is about blowing stuff up. You can't have a war on COVID. So we launched a war. We've obviously lost it because the, the progress we were making, the, the, the world, the, the economy was making in annihilating poverty was reduced. Now, somebody asked, what is poverty? Poverty is, is, is a, is, um, you know, I'd say it's a state of being in a particular culture where you're barely getting by. That is, you are struggling to, to feed yourself, to buy diapers for your children, to, for your babies, to, to pay the bills. And you're living, at, at, you know, at a very low standard of living. You barely have a car. If you have a car, it's a very old one. So you could objectively evaluate poverty, right? I mean, a lot of us were poor at some point, right? I was poor. My, you know, while I was getting, while I was going to college in, in, in the U.S., six years of uh, master's and Ph.D. I mean, I worked odds and ends job. I got a little help from my wife's dad. But generally, um, we just got by. I think I, when my kids were born, my largest expense was diapers. Monthly expense was diapers. Um, but so what, right? Sometimes you have to be poor to get wealthier, to get an education, to get to the point where you could be successful. But some people get stuck in poverty. And arguably, you could make the argument that welfare state actually encourages people to get stuck in poverty. It pays them to, get to, to, to stay poor. It provides them with the means for them to do a little better without getting a job or not advancing in your job. And actually, if you think of it, if you lose your benefit when you get a raise, then why would you get a raise? So it discourages ambition. Now, of course, really, truly ambitious people don't pay attention to incentives provided them by things like welfare. They do it anyway. Alex, I'll talk about morality of welfare in a minute. So uh, the welfare state, the war on poverty, the welfare prog programs to date have not significantly reduced poverty. What has? When, when poverty goes down, when does it go down? Well, it went down, poverty, as measured by the government, went down during the Trump administration. Why? Because unemployment went down during the Trump administration. And when unemployment goes down, poverty goes down. Isn't that amazing? The real cure for poverty is increased employment and increased productivity of labor. And productivity has gone up. And unemployment went down significantly. It started going down under Obama, but it went down even more under Trump. Part of that is the deregulation. Part of it, by the way, is the corporate tax cut, which, which as I told you when it happened, the benefits of a corporate tax cut go primarily to labor and to lower prices, less so to shareholders. Right? So corporate taxes and some deregulations led to less unemployment, Less unemployment, more people employed, leads to less poverty. Right. Yeah. Uh, David writes, uh, the Thomas Sowell track data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, notice how Thomas Sowell did it. And the IRS during the late 1980s, he tracked this data and found that only 5% of those that were in poverty, in a poverty category in a particular year, Stayed in that category if you look into the future. And that's the point. That's how you should do these kind of statistics if you're going to do anything, right? The way to do them is to look at individuals and how they progress over time, not at averages. 
Because averages are going to be impacted by the size of the next generation coming in, by how many young people there are in every given point in time. So while I don't think enough, there's enough social mobility, income mobility in the United States, I don't think there's enough people rising out of poverty and, 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 and enough mobility from the top down as well, mobility in both directions. That requires a free market. There's still a lot of mobility. And it's not that somebody born poor stays poor, as Thomas Sowell shows in his studies and as other economists have documented. But that's the kind of, that's the kind of data you would have to look at, right? Yeah, David says throughout their lifetimes, so the labor stats do represent reality. Well, they do if interpreted right, but you never see that interpretation. That is, they get the statistics, and then government bureaucrats and leftist economists, or statist economists, I should say, collectivist economists, are the ones typically using those stats in ways that don't reflect reality. And it takes a time of soul to dig into the statistics and to draw out of them the truth of what's really going on in the background. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, David, I mis mis uh, misinterpreted what you asked. So take this child credit, for example. So both... Uh, the Democrats' plan and Mitt Romney's plan. Mitt Romney has a plan that has support from a number of Republicans. Both of them involve giving direct payments to people who have children under a certain income threshold. Direct cash payments. So they have the benefit of not creating a bureaucracy. Right? It's simple. Everybody just gets a check. You have a kid, you get a check. Unless you make more than a certain amount, then you don't get a check. Of course, again, there's that threshold where if I get a raise, I lose this child benefit. Hopefully, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Right? And the story is that if we do this, child poverty in America will be reduced by 50%. Now, my guess is that when the welfare state was established, government made all kinds of promises about the reduction in poverty that was going to be generated through the welfare state. None of them came to fruition. Medicare made promises about the costs of Medicare and the benefits of Medicare. Now, the benefits, for the most part, you could argue at least, you know, we haven't seen um, a dramatic deterioration in the health care old people get yet. But the costs, anybody know by what factor? The projections about Medicare costs were wrong 10 years out. So in 1960-whatever, when, when Medicare was instituted, they said in 10 years, Medicare is going to cost X. By how much more than X? By how much were they wrong, in other words? How much more than X did it actually cost? Anybody, anybody want to take a guess? Well, since there's... A lag between me speaking and you typing, I'll tell you, a hundred. That is, for every dollar they projected, yeah, Stephanie got it right, for every dollar they projected, they actually landed up spending a hundred times that dollar. A hundred X. A hundred X. Talk about bad financial projections. So, government is fantastic. Fantastic at predicting the future of the impact of its plans. Now, all this is well known. All this has been written about. All this is out there. The fact that poverty rates have not declined. The fact that the government gets it wrong all the time. The fact that they spend more than they anticipate. The fact that they cannot make projections. All of this is known, but it doesn't make any difference. Another welfare program. And another welfare program. All the other ones didn't work. Why is this one going to work? And by the way, let's not eliminate 550 welfare programs and consolidate them into one that maybe could work. No. We're going to add one so we have now 552 welfare programs. So we can create more confusion. Voodoo economics. This time it'll work. Why? 
Well, because economists say so, but economists said so back then. Well, they're smarter now. They have AI. They have experience. They know more. It works in Europe. But no, you don't get people out of poverty, not real poverty, not long term, by writing them checks. Unless you don't care about their well-being and you're willing to do what Europeans do, which is write them big checks and do it efficiently and accept that they will never work. Accept that work is not a requirement. Yeah, Jennifer writes, can you comment on Walter Williams' idea that flunking out of high school or having illegitimate children was a large cause of poverty? Yes, I, I think the breakup of, of, the, of the black family uh, in, in the 1970s uh, coming out of one of the consequences of the welfare state um, was the destruction of the black family. I, I think much of that has gotten better in a sense that uh, single family, uh, out of wedlock pregnancies, all of that is in decline in the black community and in, in, in among poor people generally. But there's no question that that was a big factor in creating poverty. You're incentivizing it. And these child payments are going to continue to incentivize it. And, and you're going to have more kids than you can afford to have. Because, hey, uh, you know, one of these gives you 1400 bucks before birth, right? So while you're pregnant, you get 1400 bucks. I mean, 1400 bucks if you're poor is a lot of money. And then $350 a month is a lot of money. So uh, welfare creates massive distortions of incentives which nobody seems to care or learn or want to learn about. Nobody wants to learn about them. About these, nobody learns to learn from the distortions, from the fact that poverty has not come down. Just load up another welfare program. Load some more. Now, I put aside the, the morality of welfare, but let's for a minute talk about the morality of welfare. The morality of getting money to have kids. Whose money is it? So first, flip one side of the morality of this is you have to take somebody's money by force and give it to somebody else. Why? Because they're less productive. Because they have kids when they can't afford to have kids. How about the idea of don't have kids until you can afford to have them? It's all about I mean, there's no way to do this without coercion, without actually taking money from some people and giving it to others. And then it's not an accident that the government is incredibly inefficient at doing this. Because it's coerced, because there's no proper incentives, because the bureaucrats don't really care, because the people giving the money are not giving it with a clear purpose. So it, it, compare a welfare state to a charity. If I give to a charity to help poor people, let's say, I want to make sure they're doing a good job. And if they want my money the next year, they would have to come to me and convince me that they use my money well. Otherwise, I wouldn't give them the money. So they have to, they have to live up to certain standards. Now, you could say in a democracy, we vote for them. But no, you don't vote for the bureaucrats. And politicians have no incentive, really, to shape things up and to clean house. And we don't vote the bastards out. We never do. The market, the market for charity, for example, is far more efficient at making sure that the money gets used well. Now, even there, things break down because... We are so eager to give to charity because of altruism. We're so eager to give to charity because of altruism. Too many of us don't pay attention to how the money is used. See, even charities often create disincentives, often destroy those people they're trying to help. 
You know, there was a, a, a documentary called Charity Inc., which I highly recommend, Charity Inc. And it goes through all the different examples of how charities distort and pervert and actually, in some cases, actually increase poverty and hurt employment and hurt production and do the opposite of what they claim to do. And people don't monitor them closely enough because we're so committed to charity because of altruism, we don't pay attention. In a rational world, we would. So first, welfare is immoral because it requires coercion, force. It requires the stealing of money from some to give to others. And that's just wrong. If I want to help a poor person, I can do it more effectively, more productively myself. And if I don't want to help a poor person, somebody says I don't have a heart. I mean, he was kidding, but I don't have a heart, right? If I don't have a heart, so what? You get to tell me I have to have a heart? You get to tell me what my value should be? You get to tell me how I should live, what I should do with my money? No. So no, it is not right to coerce some people to fund charity and to fund an inefficient, bureaucratic, self-serving, power-lusting bureaucracy, not even charity itself. Yeah, Scott says, I saw a documentary that gave free shoes to poor in Africa and it put a company that made shoes out of business. Same with solar panels in Haiti. Same over and over and over again. You remember that charity where if you buy a pair of shoes, they donate a pair of shoes in Africa? That company did a lot of harm in Africa. A lot of harm. To local businesses that produce shoes. Suddenly you get really nice Western shoes for free. Why would you buy the local shoes? But secondly, from a morality perspective, it is what is done through welfare is evil towards the recipient. You're basically telling the recipient you're worthless. You cannot take care of yourself. You're incentivizing them to be irresponsible. You're incentivizing them to abandon personal responsibility. Don't think about how, when you should have kids and how you can afford them and how do you get a job so you can feed the kids and maybe you should only have one kid, not four, because you can't really afford four. No. The government is saying, have as many kids as you want. Here's a check. The government is saying, don't get a job. Here's a check. The government is saying, don't have pride. Don't be productive. Don't have integrity. Here's a check. The biggest victims of the welfare state are the recipients. They're institutionalized into poverty. The more you give them, the less likely it is that they go and find work. The more you give them, add to that the minimum wage, add to that business regulation, all the controls, licensing laws, you make it very expensive, very hard for them to find a job. You pay them a check so they don't find a job. And shockingly, they don't find jobs. And poverty rates stay high. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. 
But but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing. Whether you're looking at this, uh, and and you know the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.